this morning, we're going to talk about business. We're going to talk about economics, but we're not going to discuss economics in the way that you see it on TV or a podcast or hear it on the radio. We're going to talk about business as it is applicable to us and what we need to be looking at and what we need to be doing as we are looking for 2023 because it's continuing to evolve when we look at what's happened since 2020. So let's, uh, uh, I refer to this screen as the let's give a lawyer something to do screen. I have no idea what's all on there and of course it's too small for anybody to read. It's just there, it's for them. So let's think about business from where we've been since uh, 2020 when the pandemic started. And preparing for today, I was finding a bunch of ideas and I thought pictures would help to tell the story. So where are we going? Where are we going for 2023? What's gonna happen? Not sure. Uh, I found this one. I'm thinking if I were looking for a job, what's your thought? Yes, apply for the job. No, don't apply for the job. Uh, if you did go get the job, when you go to lunch, do you say, could I have my paycheck? Just, just in case. Uh, and you obviously don't ask about benefits or vacation. You just kind of, what, what's gonna happen is gonna happen. What's ahead? That's the reason for this morning's class. I have multiple points I wanna make about. So what do I see ahead from a standpoint of us as small business owners for next year? So for those of you who have not been in my classes before over the years, whether here or at, uh, at SEMA, I'll, I'll ask you where you've been. I've been here a long time, but where, where have you all been? But I gave each of you, as you came in, a, a postcard. So I grew up in a family business. When we turned the clock on 2023, if my great grandfather were still around running the family business, it would be the start of our 100th year of having been in business. And it started because he worked for a man who had like a little general store and he tried to persuade the man that you ought to put gas pumps in and the guy wouldn't do it. My great grandfather says, trust me, I think cars are gonna hang on here at this point. Uh, and in secret, he went over across the street and bought a piece of land and built his own business and started out with, a, with gas pumps out in the front. So we've been around for 100 years in, in doing aspects of business, but when I first got asked to teach about business, I thought the most important thing I need to do was, how do you learn? How do any of us learn? And the essence of what I found was that the average adult is not a good student. This is not our thing. Uh, I will credit it to the fact that we're not used to sitting in a class or even in today's world in a, a Zoom meeting. The research I found says the average adult, if they don't do something with what they've heard within 72 hours of having heard it, you're not gonna do anything with it at all. It will be in one ear and out the other. So how can I ask you, how can I help you to make the time that we're gonna be together this morning to be of value to you. So I've created the postcard. Let me explain to you how it works uh, and invite you to participate. Uh, I'll first give the disclaimer, there's no catch, okay? I have nothing to sell you. I have no products to sell you. I have no services. I'm not gonna call you to follow up. But on the side, with all the ink, down inside the little dotted line, it says pretty much so what I had just said. But then it says below that, when I get back to my business, this is what I want to do. So I invite you to grab your pen and in there write out. After we're done this morning, what are you gonna do? Now, when class is over, I want all the postcards back. And I'm gonna hold on to your postcard for two weeks. Give you time to get back into your normal routine. And somewhere during the two weeks, I'm going to attempt to read your handwriting. <laughs> okay, so you know who you are. I pull out a pen, it writes with green ink. I use green because it's the color of money, and money is what we are here to talk about. You making money. And I will give it my best shot at being legible. I'll put my note on there. I'm gonna cut the postcard apart, and I'm gonna go buy a stamp. I'm gonna mail the card to you. Now it's up to you. Throw it away, but it's your business. 
Or maybe you hold on to the card and it just eats at you with a, well, I said I was going to do this. Okay, well, just let that card hang up somewhere close that you look at and go, I do want to get this done. Now, one little short note for those who are our international visitors. On your postcard, if you're going to participate, put something really good that you're going to do because these are $1.40 to mail these things to outside the United States, okay? So if I'm going to spend $1.40 on you, okay, I, I want the investment to be something with a, you know, something of value to it. Okay, so let's talk about business. My first point I want to discuss is going to be what gets in your head. It's the media. Okay, now I call it the media. I don't call it the news. It used to be news years ago, but now it's the media. The media has an agenda. We can blame this all on Elvis Presley. There's, there's logic to this. Go to Nashville, see Elvis's pink uh, convertible Cadillac, and between the seats, he's got a record player. Now, I don't know anyone else who had a record player, and where I live, I don't know of any of the roads that would be smooth enough that the record could actually play driving down the road. But when he listened to the music on the record player, he wasn't listening to the AM radio station, and that's where you got it. Just like you got news on t by watching TV or reading a newspaper. But things changed. Where I grew up, I remember when the third TV channel came into being. And I thought as a kid, this is incredible. Three channels. What more could you possibly want in life? We now have three choices. I looked on my receiver the other day. I have 600 and some odd channels that I have blocked that knowing I will never look at them, and I blocked them, just make it easier to, to scroll through. Okay, AM became FM. Now there's a whole lot more radio stations you could listen to. And then after that, okay, we got this thing called 8-track. Okay, now for some of you, don't sit there and look at me and go, okay, what's an 8-track, all right? Ask one of us who've got this color of hair. And after that, we got cassettes, and then we got CDs, and then we got XM radio. The point of all this is that it's a division of where you can spend your time and energy and the problem creates for the media that you're not going to take and pay as close attention to them because you've got so many choices. I mean, to the extent, this is the New York Times, this is the upper corner of their newspaper, this is their slogan, all the news that's fit to print. Now, it's a lie, but that's their slogan. And why would I say it's a lie? Here in the States, look at the newspaper that you used to get on Thanksgiving morning. You needed a forklift to bring it in the house. It was so big. Today, you can send a chihuahua out on Thanksgiving morning to pick up what's left of the newspaper, if you even get a newspaper on Thanksgiving morning. So that they don't want to die, it reminds me of like when I was in college and I took a senior life-saving course, and the instructor said, Here's what you have to remember about someone who's dying, who's in a bad spot. They're desperate and they'll do anything. So like if you're going into a pond or a lake to save somebody, okay, they're down there on the bottom. They're not happy to see you and saying, oh wow, thanks for getting me. They'll drown you, okay? They, are, they get that desperate. They, don't, they can't think logically. They're that desperate and you will die with them if you don't know how to grab them to bring them up to the surface. Okay, so I mentioned dying, and this is the thing about the media. You want to hear dying? In a 10-year time period, the amount of advertising in newspaper dropped from 50 billion to 18 billion a year. 50 to 18. Think about that sales drop. Okay, the number of people in the industry in that same 10-year period, went from over 411,000 people to 174,000 people. Is that dying? So what are they doing because they're desperate? In the media, it's anything they can do to get you to pay attention to them. To the extent, if you look at Weather Channel, Weather Channel now takes and names every winter storm. 
So I can give you something to keep talking about. If you're one that whether you watch a CNN or Fox or MSNBC, can you ever see them without across the bottom breaking news, breaking news, breaking news? How do I get you to pay attention to me? And they, get, they just get this crazy about what they're doing. And when we watch this, when we read this, when we hear this, we begin to think about it in our business. And we don't need to. We really don't need to be spending that time paying attention to this stuff. So you knowing what's going on in Congress, other than they're passing in some law that can or cannot affect us, you really don't need to be watching what's going on. But they need you so that they can justify what's going on in the advertising. And I know people who just hang on this stuff. Oh my gosh, the world is ending. I go, yes, but the person they had interviewing about the big recession coming, if you look back on the history of that person, every other year, it's been a recession coming. I mean, they've predicted a recession so many times, you know eventually they will have to get it right. But it doesn't mean it's this year or next year. They're just getting time in front of the media. To the extent there's a book out called Confessions of a Media Manipulator. There is a website out there called Help a Reporter, helpareporter.com. And if you are an expert at what you do, or if you just want to get your name in the media, you go and register online and say, these are my areas of expertise. And you will get emails, depending upon your category of expertise, every day, if not several times a day, we have a reporter who's looking for this. We have a reporter who's looking for that. And it's your job to respond to that person, to say, I can help you with this story. I can do whatever you need to get it. Well, the thing is that the re these reporters don't check out the people. And this one person who wrote the book says, I just want to see if I could really control the, the news. And he says, I did. For example, he says, they were looking for someone who was an expert in the marine industry. He says, I've never owned a boat. And he goes on, here's all the different situations in my life that I have gone and been recorded in the New York Times and this television and all these things. And they, well, here's our expert to talk about this. And he goes, I don't know any of this. He says, when I, when I get a job to do all these, and they don't pay you, you're just getting the, the credit for it. He says, I go online and find what I can find online and I just start reciting what I've seen. Now, instead of slogans like this, how about this one? This is what I see as really the media. If it's gloom, we'll find room. If it bleeds, it leads. The essence of my point, determine you're the one who's in charge of what you're gonna see and what you hear. You really don't need to be watching it. I mean, I know that Walter Cronkite's no longer around. I know Huntley Brinkley no longer do the, the nightly news. It doesn't really matter, okay? Um, I do know who, uh, won the World Series. I do know who's gonna play who in each of the various football bowl games in the, in the coming weeks. But past that, I'm gonna make an investment in me and I'm gonna read business books. I'm gonna quote from one in a few minutes, but on our website, profitsplus.org, I have a list of about 200 small business books. It's people who have been in the trenches and people say, Here's ideas, and here's things that I've tried. I mean, you want people who do crazy things, like there's a book called Originals, and there's another one called Best Practices Are Stupid. And there's a guy who wrote a book called Reinventing the Wheel, except his wheel is a bicycle. And he tells you all the crazy thing he's done with his bicycle shop in an effort to take and make him pretty good. Well, he is. He happens to be the largest retailer of Trek bicycles in the world. But he does things like when a, a competitor in his community closes down, he goes and buys their phone number. So now he gets all the more business. And just, you go, well, that's bicycles. I go, yeah, but the same concept applies to my business as well. Point number two, the movie with George C. Scott where he plays General Patton. And in the movie, there's a scene where he comes up and he is uh, surrounded by all these soldiers He's in full military attire. And he gets in front of him and he's in clothes and he says, no SOB ever won a war by dying for his country. You win a war by making the other poor SOB die for his country. 
So my point to that one is, this is a challenging, this is a change in economy. This is nothing incredibly bad. We've been through this. We've gone through the Great Recession. We've had all kinds of things coming. It's just going to sound in the media like this is the big, big thing coming. It's the big one. Instead, what I see out there is I see a lot of business that I call homers. And homers for the last two and a half years have been afraid of what's going on, afraid of what's happening, afraid to try anything, afraid to do anything. They're just sitting there. And the plow hands are the ones who scare me. At the SEMA show, I visited with a couple of friends and they said, you know, it's starting to get back to normal. And I go, you scare me with that comment. No, there's so many opportunities. Okay, went to a fast food place the other day. 13 different payments that they will accept, one of which is cash. Now that's new, 13 different forms of payment because we are all learning to live electronically. We're learning to take and live in a distance. But there are people who are just, well, we're gonna do what we always did. Or another one that Seema said, well, I'm just riding the wave. And I said, here's the problem with riding the wave. You're comparing it to the wave coming in off the ocean. And it comes to the shore and it stops and it's over and it's done with. You're riding the boost that you got during the pandemic. Like it's going to come and it's going to go and at the end you're gonna go, oh, that was nice. I appreciate the extra business. Why not instead look at it from the perspective, I, I appreciate what the pandemic brought to me business-wise, but instead, what am I going to do to keep the business going? People have changed all kinds of things in their life. Where do I in my business take advantage of that? Where do I build from that? and not look at it as some way that came and went, or it, well, times were good at one point and now they're gone. This is a time of opportunity. There are still people out there who are very scared about what has happened and what's going on because they're hearing this word recession keep coming. And those who are bold enough to take business from somebody else, well, they're not doing this anymore. Well, don't look, well, my gosh, that's a sign. I mean, there's, my dad told me a story when I was a kid about a man who had no education, and in a big city, he ran a corner hot dog stand. And he saved money and sent his son to college. And when the son would come home to visit the dad, he would look at his dad's small house and the parts in the house where he had stored all the necessary supplies for the little hot dog stand, and he would say, Dad, what do you do with all this stuff? Dad, don't you watch the news? Don't you hear what they're saying? There's a recession coming. Don't hold on to all this stuff, Dad. And he goes, I'm uneducated. My son is smart. He's, a, he's gonna be a college graduate, so I should listen to him. And he started listening and paying attention to what the son said. And every time the son would come home to visit his dad from college, the son would again preach the same message. Dad, you know, hold on to the cash. Don't hold on to this. Nothing makes money like inventory, nothing. No stock market makes anything in the realm of money the way inventory does. But the man listened to what the son said and you know what, within a few months, sure enough, his business was in a recession because he would run out of inventory at two and three in the afternoon, couldn't take care of the rest of his customers. It takes from the, bold, from the scared, it gives to the bold. If someone is going to do this, if someone's going to participate in this challenge of business, don't be the plow hand, don't be the homer. Be the person what we call in the South, hold my beer, watch this. And what can I do and what can I try? That's the place to be. What are the opportunities out there? There are plenty of money who have made, many, of, many folks who have made a lot of money just in the last two years by knowing how to do it and their business is still continuing to grow going forward. Three on the list. The most important lesson of small business. Never forget a customer. Never let a customer forget you. Okay? 
Never forget a customer. Never let a customer forget you. No matter how long ago it was that they did business with you, and no matter how small the purchase was they made from you. So I asked, do you advertise? And most everyone says yes. And I go, why are you advertising? Well, I'm looking for new customers. Well, what's wrong with the old ones? Why do we spend all this time and effort looking for new customers and not paying attention to someone who has done business with us in the past looking for them? I don't understand it. What we will continue to see is all kinds of businesses, like I do is go watch TV for this one, who advertise item and price, item and price, item and price, trying to woo new customers into their business, okay? Item and price is not necessary right now. Right now, it's a, if we've got it on hand, it's for sale. I drove by a used car dealership last week. I drove by a friend's service center. There were more cars and trucks sitting at the service center than there were at the used car dealership. He can't find them to sell. He can't find parts to fix the ones that he's got. He's just become a parking lot. Item and price is very irrelevant at this point. It's do you have it? And again, inventory is the best investment you can possibly make. I, I would prove it. On my website, I've got a calculator called Return on Investment. I, you, it's, it's free. You go up, you punch your numbers. There's no cookies or any of that stuff on our website, so none of your numbers are looked at. But you go in and you put it there and you look at the main ingredient, which is inventory turn. How fast are you turning the inventory that you got? And how much of my inventory is sitting there doing nothing? It's dead. It's costing you. I teach a class on that topic, and in the sample business we created, it was a relatively small business that was doing $800,000 a year. And we guesstimated with this owner how much dead inventory was sitting there and said, what if you got rid of that inventory and put it into stuff that would actually sell? The profit in this sample business doubled just by putting inventory into places of stuff that you could actually move. I want to spend my advertising money to retain the customers I've got as compared to try to find somebody else. One of our family businesses over the year, we sold power equipment. Over a 30 year time period with a file cabinet, with little four by six index cards, I could tell you every piece of power equipment we had ever sold by customer's name, address, phone number, make, model, serial number, and the price they paid for it. That is an invaluable database, simply to be able to talk to people, because we sell stuff that wears out, and they're going to want more. And I just wanted to make sure that you know who I am and where I'm at. Two out of three people leave and go someplace else because they think you don't care. They think you don't care. Recently on Facebook, a friend of mine, she's a school teacher, and she posted about how much she loved Chewy and how much business she would do with Chewy, and she would never, ever go to a pet store to buy things. Seems she made a call to Chewy one day, and she says, I have automatic shipment of cat food and cat litter. I need to cancel it. And the lady on the other end says, may I ask why? And the friend said, yes, my cat died. The teacher comes home the next day. And her neighbor comes over and says, I, have, I took this package in for you. It was a flower arrangement and a card. Sorry to hear about the loss of your cat. Name the cat, continued on, and the person who took the phone call from Chewy signed the card. 
And when I told that story recently and someone in the audience says, yeah, you know what? They also send your cat, your dog, whatever critter you got, they send them a birthday card. I have a friend who owns a jewelry store. It's my wife's favorite place to shop. It's amazing that when you go into a place like that and you say, they'll ask me, what are you shopping for? It's her birthday, it's an anniversary, it's Valentine's. Tell me why a business like that does not write it down and make a point to call me. You know, call me 50 weeks later. Hey, Valentine's is coming. What are you going to get her? Hey, your anniversary is coming. And yet makes no effort to retain me as a customer. Things like having rewards programs for our customers. Okay? The neat thing is, in the automotive trade, we have a tendency to follow what's going on in the retail trade. They have an idea, they kind of cook it, they make it going, and then slowly but surely in working with customers, it comes towards us. Let me tell you what's coming next. Past having rewards programs, what's on the, I won't, I'll say more than what's on the horizon, it's going all over the place, is a premium reward program. I charge you a fee every month, and this gets you priority on something, whatever it may be. It could be on delivery, it could be on prices. One of the most recent ones I've seen is, oddly enough, Panera Bread. Okay, I think everybody's seen a Panera Bread somewhere. You pay Panera Bread $7.99, ah, you do this? See, right here, $7.99 a month to be a Panera Bread customer. He pays that. It's hitting his credit card every month. If you, excuse me, if you come into Panera, it's free coffee. But the problem with coming into Panera is to get your free cup of coffee every day is you have to pass by all the pastries, all the foods. And Panera is counting on their staff Todd, you don't really just want a cup of coffee, do you? How about, how about a pay? Would you like a Danish this morning? Good okay. morning. And, and you buy it. I mean, he pays for it. You go to Starbucks, and the cheapest cup of coffee is $3.65. Okay, but Starbucks sells more coffee than Panera. But this is Panera's way to bite into the marketplace. It's an investment. 76% of consumers say they will pay to be a member of your premium loyalty program. 79% of consumers say that they don't want to accumulate points anymore and be part of someone's traditional loyalty program. They want something that gives them an immediate reward, like every morning I can have that cup of coffee. Keeping the stone rolling is easier than to get it starting all over again. No, I'm not suggesting we stop advertising, however you do it. But it needs an examination as to why do you do it. What are you expecting from it? Well, my competition does it. That is not the right answer. A friend of mine was the marketing person for Eckerd Drug Stores. Eckerd's was in the southeast United States. They're now part of uh, CVS and Walgreens. They split them up and sold off all their stores. His job as their marketing expert was to create the flyer that looks a lot like Walgreens and CVS that would be anywhere from 16 pages to 64 pages and show up in the Sunday newspaper. And when newspapers were popular, he told Jack Eckerd, we need to quit this, this is not working. He says, Jack, let me tell you the statistics. 8% of our sales comes, become, comes to us because of a flyer. Read the number backwards. If 8% of our sales come because of that flyer. 92% of our sales were coming anyway. We're spending all this time and money to go after 8%. Is that worth it? Worse yet, the customers who come in because of the flyer and someone in the business attempts to sell something else, the question they get is, is it on sale? And if the answer is no, they don't buy it. Only 4% of the 8%, this is minute, 
will buy something else in the drugstore that's not on the flyer. Why would you spend that time and effort looking to do that? It's, it's the same thing with advertising. Why do we take and do this stuff? What's the purpose? Now mind you, my point is, I want to do it, don't stop. But what's the point of it? Can you measure it? Can you tell me that it's working? And I think if you can't tell me it's working, I think you're just spending dollars for the sake of spending dollars because someone else out there is spending dollars. You gotta find a way to measure it and make the thing actually work. Number five on my list. It becomes a one-way street. So I'm thinking of changing my target customer. Things have changed in the last couple of years. And I go, wait, but you've been in business all these number of years. Why would you change? I would like perhaps additional customers, but why would I change who I'm targeting? Okay, This is what a customer looks for. Are you convenient? What's the hours that you're there? Do you take and have products available to me? What level of customer service do you give to me? This is where a customer is in today's marketplace. Do we pay attention to these components? Again, the concept of a discount. No, no, no. It's not necessary. I walked into a uh, Walmart, walking down an aisle, and I see where they have all the energy drinks. If I had bought every energy drink that this Walmart had, I could put them in a little hand basket. Why would you ever put the stuff on sale? It's just, is it available? Do I, do I have stuff? This is not a way to attract customers, to say, I'm going after discounting. It doesn't need to be there. You're just giving away profit at this point. Do you have it? Number seven, with what's gone on in the last two and a half years, I see a lot of people who are puffing their chest and being pretty proud of what their business has been. And I kick back and going, you didn't do a thing. You didn't do any of it. You were just there. Businesses that will make changes, that will try things, that will do things, okay? You get the credit when you do something. You get no credit for just because you're riding along with what the economy's doing. And you also take the responsibility when something doesn't go right. And the person says, well, we don't make mistakes. And I go, you're not trying enough. If you can say, I don't make any type of mistakes in my business, they go, you're not trying. You gotta have some failures. You gotta try some things. That as to what you, what services that you do, what products, and something, like, I thought it would work. But at least I gave it a shot. I mentioned I'd try some, share with you some of the books. There's a contemporary thought leader, his name is Seth Godin. He's, he writes books that cause you to think and look at things. His first book was called uh, Purple Cow. And it talked about distinguishing your business and driving down a road and seeing cows and you see one cow and it's purple. And that purple cow will stick in your mind until you start seeing all kinds of other purple cows because people are copying it. And then if you want to be different, you gotta do something else because everyone has caught up to you. The next book, which caught my attention, was called The Big Moo, M-O-O. -O. The Big Moo has 31 chapters. 31 authors, and at the back of the book, he tells you who the authors are, but he doesn't tell you who wrote each chapter. But there are people that you may see in the news, or you gotta go, yeah, this person thinks a little differently, like Mark Cuban, who owns the Dallas Mavericks and is on one of those TV shows. Okay, you know the guy thinks differently. I like to hear his thoughts. Well, this isn't Mark Cuban's, what I'm gonna share with you, uh, because it is, uh, it's either written by someone from England or Canada, Okay, because you spell things differently. You know, 
like flavor and jewelry, you know, and stuff like that. You're like Vanna White on steroids. You had all these extra vowels in there that we don't use here. But the chapter is called They Say I'm Extreme. Let me share a couple pieces with it. I, I find it to be the most stimulating thing out there. Um, I don't drink coffees, I don't drink teas, I don't drink colas, I don't drink anything with any caffeine in it, any, anything stimulating. Uh, if you see me walking around with a drink in my hand, okay, it's hot chocolate, that's it. This, from what I can tell, is the feeling that comes from downing a couple of those big energy drinks all of a sudden. They say that I'm extreme, and I say I'm a realist. They say I demand too much, and I say they accept mediocrity and continuous improvement far too readily. They say we can't handle this much change, and I say your job, your career are in jeopardy. What other options do you have? They say we need an initiative. I say we need a dream and some dreamers. They say plan it. I say let's do it. They say we need more steady, loyal employees. And I say we need a few more freaks who will routinely tell those of us in charge to go take a flying leap before it's too late. They say we need good people. And I say we need quirky talent. They say we like people with steely determination say I can make it better. I say I love people with a certain manacle gleam in their eyes. And perhaps even a giggle will say I can turn this whole world upside down. Just watch me. They say, we need, sure that we do need change now. And I say, we need revolution now. They say, be a fast follower. And I say, be a battered and bruised leader. They say, conglomerate and imitate. I say, create and innovate. They say, market share. I say, it's market creation. They say improve and maintain. I say destroy and reimagine. They say normal. I say weird. They say they want a team that works and lives in harmony. And I say give me a raucous brawl among the most creative people imaginable. They say we need happy customers. And I say you give me those pushy, needy, nasty, provocative customers. They say we seek Harvard MBAs. I say I seek certificate free PhDs from the School of Hard Knocks. They say they want recruits that have spotless records. And I say it's the spots that matter the most. They say integrity is important. And I say, tell me the unvarnished truth all the time or take a hike. They say this is daunting. I say it's a hoot. They say zero defects. I say a day without a screw up or two is a day you just wasted away. They say think about it. I say try it. They say plan it. I say, test it. They say, radical change will take a decade. I say, radical change takes a minute. They say, times are changing. And I say, everything has already changed. Tomorrow is the first day of your revolution, or you are toast. They say, we can't all be revolutionaries. And I say, why not? They say, we can't all be a unique brand. I say, why not? They say this is just a rant. I say this is just reality. <sighs> There's this tingle when I read that. It's like, you have to be like the energy drink. I just want to go do something. I just want to try something. I want people to ask me, why are you doing that? Because I can and I want to see what happens. Well, it might not work, and it might work. I just can't follow the flow. I just can't do it like everyone else does it. I want to know. I want to try. I have a friend who thinks my postcard is the stupidest thing out there. And this friend says, I couldn't read it because they tell me stuff and I don't want to hear it. And I go, how do you get better? If you don't hear what they say, how do you get better? If you don't assimilate that information going, what can I do differently? Awesome reading, the whole book. 
This is not a time to ride along with what goes on in the trade. This is a time to go down to the show floor and look for people who are doing stuff really out there and listen to them and adapt it differently to your business. Don't run and talk with the herd. When you go to a booth and you visit with a vendor, ask him, who's the craziest customer you got? Where do I find that person? I want to talk to them. Make up your mind, act decidedly, and take the consequences. No good is ever done in this world by hesitation. Number seven, someday my prince will come. Okay, it's a Disney song, and no, I'm not going to try to sing it to you. But if something in your business hasn't been working, or someone in your business has not been working, it's time to go. What we're already short-staffed. It's still time for them to go. There are folks out there that I see this who are so desperate that they employ people by what we used to call the mirror test. Someone walks in the door, you ask them to stand still, you take a mirror and you put it right here and you wait 30 seconds. At the end of 30 seconds, you look at the mirror and if the mirror has fogged, they're alive. If they're alive, they're hired. <laughs> you don't need the business that bad. Okay, now I need to address one other thing uh, comes to mind, this postcard deal and, and where you're sending it. Uh, this happened at SEMA. Uh, this person comes in and this person is in my audience every year and says, I need to tell you what happened with the postcard. He says, remember last year, we were talking about, I did a class on, on staffing. He says, remember you talked about firing people? He says, I made a decision right there that I was going to fire Amanda. And I wrote it on the postcard. When I get back to my business, I want to. <laughs> <laughs> well, he says, what do you think the chances are that a little over two weeks later, the postcard shows up, and as the mailman hands it, the postcard is on the top of the stack. And the side of what I'm going to do is on the top. And guess who took the mail from the mailman? And she walks it up to me and says, is this me? Okay, now mind you, this is over two weeks afterwards. Is this me? And I said, very sheepishly, yes. And she said, am I fired? And with a gulp, I said, yes. So here's my offer. I got a big stack of these I brought with me. If you need extras, okay? <laughs> if anyone needs a few more, okay? I'll invest the stamp for you if you want, you want to fire some people. Now, the weird one was, at SEMA, I did get a card this year, and it had a list. Not just a person, it had a list of people that were being terminated. But be willing to make the change. Otherwise, what we have is the situation, there's an old man sitting on his front porch, just rocking away, and he's got his dog laying there on the porch next to him. And a neighbor comes over. And the neighbor sits down in the other rocking chair, and the two were just conversing and rocking away, having a good time. But the dog, laying on the porch, all this mournful, and the neighbor says, what's wrong with the dog? And the man says, he's got a burr in his tail. Well, then why doesn't he reach around and bite the burr out? And the man says, because it doesn't bother him enough to do anything about it. And we see that. And that happens. And we keep thinking that this person is going to take and get better at some point in time. Or if we're looking at it because of a product that we sell or a service that we offer and thinking, no, somewhere, this is, uh, we've invested in this and somewhere along the line, it's going to start working. It has to start working. No, it doesn't. Sometimes it's take a product category and get rid of it. 
important part is in, in looking at a change in the business is that you focus your business on who, not what. We as an industry focus on what we do and what we sell. Focus on who the customer is and what all is there in their life that we could address because they know us and they trust us and they continue to do business with us. Where I live, there's a business called Cars Chain Reaction. And it was very easy the first time I saw it because the signs on the building were steel and uh, grasshopper, okay? Power equipment stuff. Some residential, a lot of commercial stuff. And I thought, okay, I get it. chain reaction. Okay, cute name. But then as I get closer on the building, I see a sign that says Trek Bicycles. Oh, okay, also cool name, chain reaction. When I go into the place, this business does sell all kinds of lawnmowers and chainsaws and string trimmers and bicycles and hiking stuff and disc golf stuff. I mean, it, you go, well, that's a weird combination. And the answer is no, it's the right combination. He has identified who in his area and who is an outdoor person who is an outdoor person therefore there are products and services my who is going to buy from someplace it's going to be me his whole business focus on who the things i can do for this customer so as i look at it, i go well you know what about pool chemicals for all the people who got swimming pools? Got to buy it someplace. You sell the lawnmowers. Well, what about the um, shovels, rakes, and hoes and other stuff to go with it? The opportunities are endless when we focus our business on who we sell to as compared to staying with exactly with this is what I do. See, like I know there's someone here today who has this really neat trailer and they sell parts at the races. Okay, now what else could they sell? You know, you might get in trouble with the racetrack owner if you added refreshments, but it'd be something to look at. Okay, you, there might be other things because as these people are coming to you that you could add to what you're doing. But unfortunately, many, many of us can go, this is my area of expertise and that is generally the challenge. My area of expertise is the product or the service. My area of expertise too often is not a business. I'm a this person who happens to own a business. No, no, no. It's like I'm a business owner. People, what you know, I go, I'm an entrepreneur. I look for ways to make money. In our family, we have several times bought businesses and I did not know squat about anything that we sold. But I learned it, and with every customer coming in, I asked them questions. What are you going to use this for? How do you do this? I'm just curious to ask you. And, and they're not like, hey, well, are you just stupid or something? <laughs> That's another point, another day. It's a, I'm wanting to know what you're doing with it. And as you learn these things about stuff, and go, oh, I could sell them this, and I could add this to it. And then after a period of time, you get customers, how do you know all this stuff? I just listen to you. That's where I grow my business. I just listen to you and go, there's another opportunity of something else we could sell or do. For example, we had a business at one point was in Florida and we had customers who came in carrying what looked like gas cans, okay? The two and a half gallon gas can, but they're yellow. Okay, anybody know what goes in the yellow ones? In some cases, yes but it also holds sodium hypochlorite. Okay, commonly known as Clorox, only double strength. It's what people pour into their pools as a sanitizer. And we had people who came into our business all the time carrying these containers. I need these filled, we don't fill them. Okay, I don't make money when I say I don't fill those. 
and we studied it and we learned what it was. They generally walk in with two, so that's five gallons. We learned about it. We acquired the necessary stuff, one of which was an 800 gallon tank that twice a week they came and filled it. Okay, someone wanna do the math real quick? Twice a week you pump in 800 gallons, so that's 1600 gallons. I'm selling it 500 gallons at a time, five gallons at a time. How many transactions is that every week? Somewhere north of 300? Okay, I got 300 and some odd people who come in every week. Now, what else can I sell you? Well, it's a pool. Well, what else goes to the pool? Oh, they need this, they need this, they need that, and all that. And it's like, it was it just like, where are you going next? I don't know, it just depends on what someone asked for. They trust us, they'll buy it from us. They trust who we are. Number eight. Gut feeling. Okay, all of us who either started a business or bought a business, you may have looked at numbers, and I hope you did, but the big thing was something down here kicked in at some point and you go, yeah, this is what I need to do. Yeah, th this makes sense. Something down in here is telling me, okay, that's the entrepreneur and you're kicking in. Something down here is telling me to do this. Unfortunately for too many people, once they acquire the business, the gut feeling gets locked away in a box, never to be talked to again. What's the gut feeling telling you now? Open it up. Where are the opportunities? What can I try? Now, mind you, there is calculation that has to go with this. If it's a complete failure, how much is it gonna cost me? Can I afford that loss? That's a, this, is, this is not a rah-rah session. This is a, I have to look at it and I have to consider things. And if it fails, what, what is this going to cost me? But if it succeeds, what's it gonna do for my business? Where is it gonna put me? What's it gonna allow me to do? What about the people who work for you? You know, boss, I get people asking me for all the time. That customer is saying to you, if you had it, I'd buy it from you. But since you don't, or since you don't do that, that's not one of the services you offer, since you don't do it, and I trust you, where are you telling me to go to do business? And you're naming somebody, and they're not sending you a commission check. Maybe that's a sign that says, that's where we need to go. That's what we need to be doing differently in our business. Like my great grandfather, he couldn't get the man he worked for to add a gas pump. And in secret, he bought this land across the street. And my great uncle would tell the stories as I remember as a little boy being in that store and the man looking across the street going, I wonder what that is they're building across the street there. He says, daddy knew he, he needed the job he just says, yeah, I wonder what they're building. And then one day he says he gave him his notice. He says, the guy who owned the business says, where are you going? He says, well, strange you would ask. You know that building across the street there? There's a sign going up and it's gonna say, G.W. Brown's three in one. Convenience, groceries, gasoline. I cannot in my hometown find anyone who remembers the man where my great grandfather worked. My great-grandfather died in the 70s. I, know, I can go home and people remember him. They all in town remember my grandfather. But no one remembers this guy. He just, he came and he went. The uh, Great, Re Great Depression. What, what stopped the Great Depression? Anybody remember? What brought the end of the Great Depression? World War II. World War II. You've seen that bumper sticker, war is good business? Okay, that's where it comes from. Sears and Penny's had gone through the Great Depression and they both, in essence, shut down. Okay, some of you young ones may not remember Sears or Penny's. They're both kind of like dead businesses today. Um, when it was over, Penny said, let's sit quiet. Sears said, no, Johnny is coming home marching from war. And Jane was an army nurse and she's coming home. 
So when Johnny and Jane get together, there's going to be Judy's and Jimmy's popping up all over everywhere, and someone's got to sell them all this stuff. And they, we, they started selling all this stuff to them. Sears went gangbusters. Pennies fell behind. Sears went to credit cards. Pierce, pennies did not follow. So what happened to both of them? They became corporate suits who didn't have a gut feeling to check and see what to do. Sears was so bad to the point, for those of us who remember when computers first became things people could have, the first of the internet services that you could have for your home was a service called Prodigy. Not AOL, Prodigy. Sears owned it. Sears could have owned the internet and they blew it. I think there's 17 Sears stores left now. There'll be museums soon. Not to decide is to decide. Never fool yourself. Refusing to make a decision is a decision. Just saying, it's the way it happens. Number nine, financially. Here's a quick exercise to take you just a few minutes. Take a P&L statement from your business. Look at all the expenses. Next to each line of expense, I want the letter U or C. One of the two, all of them have to have it. U stands for uncontrollable. That's an expense that absolutely has to happen. I don't mean it's like a cell phone. Oh no, I gotta have my cell phone. No, you don't. We came to these trade shows for years. Well, how'd your business run when you were gone? You know, they actually thought. When I was here, my employees actually thought and were not dependent upon me to make every decision for them. You can't get me. There's a phone out in the hall when I'm not, when I got time off the show, floor, I may call and check in. And then again, I might not. And I'm not telling you what hotel I'm at. Yeah, we actually had employees who made decisions instead of sending us boss, what do I do here? It was different at that point. Controllable, uncontrollable. I mean like, unless you're in the Amish community, okay? I would say electricity is pretty much on uncontrollable. Got to have it. A lot of things are controllable. Everyone's got a U or a C. Go down the same list again, and next to every expense, I want the letter F or the letter V. F, it's a fixed dollar amount. V, it's a variable dollar amount. If it's fixed, you know, there's no ups and downs. V. The amount varies from month to month. Now look at all the letter combinations. Look for the combination UF. By your definition, not mine, your definition, it is an uncontrollable fixed dollar amount. Scratch a line through it and forget them because there's nothing you can do about it. Every other expense on your profit and loss statement, in part or in whole, you can do something about it. That and the next three weeks of this year is what you look at and say, those are items I need to control for next year. I have seen far too many financial statements in the last two and a half years from businesses that have gotten out of control because as revenue took a big jump, their operating expenses took a big jump, and what I look for is percentages. As a percentage of the revenue, what's your payroll? As a Percentage of your revenue. What is the occupancy cost? What is your advertising? Your expenses overall. And I see businesses, they're so happy with how much money they're making, and then I get to burst their bubble. I say, you know, when I look at your expenses, by the way, I have another free calculator on the website you can use called Multi-Year Analysis. Go in, just punch in your numbers, and take a look at it for 19, 20, 21, and 22 to date. And this person, I looked at their business, and I said, yeah, I'd be happy too with that. But here, if you were to take and have maintained as a percentage of revenue all of your expenses at the best over the four years, your net profit would be doubled. This tells me you're not paying attention. You're not paying attention to running your business. Accountants will tell us this one. Take a blank piece of paper and create a budget for next year. That is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. You got how many years of experience? That's saying, throw away all the experience you got. Don't look at it. No, that's, a, that's like a real definite no. Look at several years and go, what's the trends? What do I see? Where's this thing going? All right, this is not for your accountant to look at. This is for you. Last point, it's dollars, not percentages. Some of us have learned this lesson the hard way. 
I'm making a lot of money. Great. Look at the checking account. I don't have money in there. Ooh, this is a real problem, okay? Because we don't pay bills with profits. We pay bills with cash. They are not related to each other. Businesses that have gone gangbusters in the last two and a half years are the biggest concern because of not controlling expenses, not knowing what to be looking for. Cash on hand is the thing. All right, you have to understand financials. Okay, not like, I, I took one class in school on accounting. That's all I've ever taken. Then how do I learn all the rest of it? I felt the need to survive. I'm not going to depend upon some accountant, even though he's a close friend. I'm going to, because when I'm talking to the accountant, we're going to have a really good conversation. And I'm going to drill him, and he's going to say, you wear me out. And I go, yeah, because I'm probably the only customer you've got who actually understands his financials, and I'm asking you what's going on here. What happened to this? What is this? Why, what am I looking for here? There is so much in your financial statement that you're the only one who can make the decision. The accountant cannot make it. And they do every day, thinking you don't understand it. Anyone ever had a conversation with your accountant about what's the legal entity of your business? You've got six options in the United States. Ever had a conversation with your accountant about depreciation? And yet you can answer the one question that's most important in determining how depreciation is going to work in your business. Well, isn't that the, something the accountant does? Yeah, he calculates it. But you are the one who can tell him how to calculate. Well, I don't know how to do that. Read. Read and understand this. So about 10 years ago, our accountant died. And uh, so I went to, my wife is in the financial field, and she says, talk to this guy. Okay. So uh, I talked to him and said, we'll use you. And about the third year, he walks into my wife's office one day, and, she, and he says, uh, well, I guess you know um, your husband fired me. And she goes, yeah, I heard. He says, he doesn't get it. See, what you're supposed to do is you have all these papers and these files, whether you hand them pages or whether you send something electronically to them. Okay, you're supposed to give that to me and let me do my job. He, me, he wants to talk to me. He wants to discuss it. And she goes, oh, I see why he fired you. He also died last year. Okay, it's not like I'm a bad sign with accountants, but two of them have died. My current accountant, I'm not really telling them what's happened to the old ones. Okay, your accountant cannot watch this stuff. You have to watch it, it's that important. You want to learn about financials? Go back to my, go up to my website. I write a lot of magazine articles, like I've written for PRI and SEMA. Uh, I write a lot of articles about understanding things in financials, okay? There's over 400 articles on my website. There's an index, it runs you through all of them. Take them all, Re read through them. You want to understand how cash flow works? Go up to my website. I have an hour and a half recording where I have created two Excel files and say, He'll show you which one to take, and here's how you build cash flow projections to tell you what's going on. If I took, there it is, my laptop, and sat down with someone's financial statements, and we had discussion, give me a couple hours, I could tell you how much money would be in your checking account for November 30th of 2023. I could tell you that today. Okay, well that's pretty cool, uh, you can do it yourself. Go up and listen to it, it's on the website. Okay, last point I gotta tell you. Okay, where'd they go? There. Everybody, except for the one that fell on the floor, you, these are in front of you. If you would, please take a moment. Open your camera, scan the sucker. Okay, tell me how we had a good time when we were here this morning, what we did. The postcard. If I need to remind you about doing something business-wise, fill out the postcard. You just leave it in the seat. I'll come and collect them when we're done. Whatever comes in the next year, two years, three years, this is not about hiding and waiting for some kind of storm to go passing. It's going to rain. It's about dancing in the rain. And the dance we're going to do together 
It's going to be the happy dance. Thanks for coming.